God's so good. Thank you, guys. That is so in, inspirational and goodness, uh, instructional and everything else about that. Man, to praise and worship the Lord and glorify and honor Him in some real ways. Good night. It's just amazing how God works in our life in these days. And we look at your neighbor and say, we certainly do need it. Uh, we certainly do need it. Uh, we, uh, we're in the book of Revelation, and I know you guys are aware of this. We have uh, a couple of messages in. This is what the couple I know on your outline are your notes, and let me just mention about these notes. Um, th these notes are a little bit different than uh, what I've done for the past 10 years with notes uh, to you guys. You know, I always try to have some notes for you, and a lot of times they're in the form of outlines, um, especially when I'm on a certain theme. I may, you know, take a passage and try to get a theme, and then I try to get, give you points that give you some indications of, as to what that is. And, you know, sometimes I try to make them cute by making alliterations and things, analogies, help you remember things by and leave you blanks so you can fill in the blanks. So hopefully you'll at least be listening enough to fill in the blank. It's kind of like little listening guides and stuff like that. These notes are just a little bit different, and they'll remain so, I, I feel sure, throughout the book of Revelation, because these notes are just basically an attempt to share with you information that I think you should have uh, in, uh, verse by verse through the book, uh, because sometimes the book lends itself to be in the form of an outline. Like, there will be places along in these 22 chapters where you have sections that have um, parts that you can break up. Like, you know, when you get to seven seals and seven trumpets and seven vials and seven woes and, se you know, when you get to sections like that along, you know, like chapter six, seven, eight, ten, all, when you get to those, you know, you might be able to have a little point, you know, trumpet one, trumpet two, trumpet three, blah, blah. But, uh, you know, along the way, we're going verse by verse, and I don't plan to skip any verses. I don't plan to try to, you know, leave anything out because you need to see all of it to see what the Lord is saying to you because God blesses you, and I know I've said this to you, but I just want to keep reminding you because a lot of times we're discouraged from reading the book of Revelation, teaching the book of Revelation, or coming to try to hear the book of Revelation because you have been convinced maybe somewhere along the way you have somehow been encouraged to believe that you can't understand the book, that the book is written to be confusing and to, and to not really be understandable. Well, I just want you to know that that is absolutely not true. Look at your friend and say, you can understand this. And the reason I say this is by its very name, revelation. What does revelation mean? It means to reveal. It means to allow people to see. And God says to you, his people who are led by his spirit, uh, you're blessed. Matter of fact, in the third verse of the first chapter, he promises to bless you if you will read this book, if you will understand this book, if you will do the things that are written in this book, he promises a blessing. Now, I believe all the books in the Bible are blessed by God. Don't get me wrong. I believe that every book in the Bible can bless you. It can teach you. It can, it can place things into your heart and into your life, and the Holy Spirit can use them to carry you forward, and your life can be blessed by every book in the Bible. But this is the only book that begins and ends with a blessing both times at the beginning and the end of the book, it's like the Spirit of God says, oh, let me just remind you, blessed is he who reads the words of this book and understands it and, 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 and does the things that are written in this book. So it's no wonder that the enemy of our soul and the enemy of our spirit would encourage us not to read the book because even though most people have heard of the book of Revelation, and maybe as a Christian, you've even thought, man, that revelation, that'd be, that'd be an interesting book to study. And maybe you're hungry to hear a little bit out of it, but you, don't, but you don't jump in. And the enemy encourages you not to jump in because he convinces you that you can understand it, that it's written in a way that's not intended to be understood. And God says just the opposite. God says, 
this is a revealing. This is taking off the covering. This is an apocalypsis. This is, this is to remove the veil of the book. And whereas in generations before, like in the book of Daniel and some of the writings of Isaiah and some of the other writings, the Spirit of God said, seal these things up for this is not the day for them to be opened up and revealed. Well, those days are over now and these are the days that they are to be opened up and revealed. That word that was covered for those, you know, a couple of thousand years ago, three or four thousand years ago, it wasn't going to happen in those days. It wasn't going to be for those days. So the Spirit of God said, don't, don't add confusion and write things that, that you see. Seal it up in the book, for it's not for these days. But now the book of Revelation says, all right, open these things up so people can see, so they can be prepared for what's going on in these last days. And so I have felt inspired for a year, preached through Philippians, preached through James. It was almost like, come on, Lord, let's go. And I felt all the time that God was leading us toward the book of Revelation. And I believe that God has a word for us. It's not just spooky things that are going to happen, you know, at the end of the world, but it also has a tremendously important message for us as we prepare and we live in these days. Because even though, and I'm gonna, I'll say this and I'll explain this a little bit more if it, if it kind of leaves a little thought hanging in your mind about when we're going to go with the Lord. When I use the word rapture, uh, that word is really not a Bible word. The word rapture is not found in the Bible. So if you're in a concordance and you're looking up rapture, you're not going to find it. It's not going to pull up the word rapture because the word rapture is not in the Bible. That is a word we use for, for an event that happens according to Thessalonians and other verses where we are taken up, where we're called up off the earth. To be taken up off the earth is described by the word rapture. So that great upgathering is just collectively discussed as God's people coming dead and alive, coming off this earth and meeting with Jesus in the clouds. And Jesus takes us back to glory so that we can be with the Lord forever and so ever be with him. So that's an event that is, uh, that's the next event on the prophetic calendar. That's the event that we're all thinking about when, you know, as the Lord coming like a thief in the night and no one's going to know when it's going to happen. Just like you don't know when a thief's going to break into your house. The only way you know that one was there is when he leaves, you see something he took. Well, Jesus' coming for us is described as a thief in the night, which means he'll come and go before anybody even knows that he's been there. And the only way you'll know he's been there is that he's taken something. But the difference between an earthly thief and the heavenly thief is that, that the heavenly thief takes only that which belongs to him. An earthly thief takes things that doesn't belong to him, but Jesus, the heavenly thief, and I know that's kind of a weird analogy to think of Jesus as a heavenly thief, but that's what, that's what Thessalonians says and Matthew says. It says, you know, two will be working in the fields, one will be taken and one will be left. Two will be grinding at the mill and one will be taken and one will be left. And he comes like a thief in the night, is the analogy, is the word picture. And he's, so he is a heavenly thief. But he only takes that which belongs to him. So look at your neighbor and say, do you belong to him? Okay, see, that's the question. That is the question. Do you belong to him? Because when he comes, we won't know it until it's over. So when you look around and you say, where is uh, my sister? I loved her. She loved the Lord. Oh, I don't know. And then there's going to need to be an explanation and According to 2 Thessalonians 2, there's going to be a force on this earth, and I don't want to introduce too many characters right now, but you'll understand all of them as we go through. Believe me, you'll probably get tired. You'll know who they are. But there will be one on this earth that, is, uh, that has been given power over this earth by, the, by an evil life, and it's the Antichrist. By the way, uh, just to give you an idea of how in-depth God is and how great he is and how the patterns of God repeat over and over. Everything that is godly 
seems to be revealed in threes. You know, there is, uh, there is heaven and there's earth and there's water, there's, there's a body, there's soul, there's spirit. Uh, we're triune beings that God reveals things and God creates things in threes and so forth. So there is a God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In, in the end, there will be a, 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 a devilish trio like that. The, the, the God the Father is represented in evil terms by a character called the beast, and you'll see him in the book of Revelation. He's like the Father God. He's an imitation of God the Father. He does the same kind of things that God does, only in evil ways. And then, of course, you see the Antichrist, which you've heard that word a bunch of times. He'll be on the earth. He'll be in charge of a lot of things. And he is the anti, obviously, Christ. So we have the beast is the anti-God. The anti-Christ is the anti-Jesus Christ spirit. And then there's another character mentioned in Revelation called the false prophet. And the false prophet, you will see, empowers the Antichrist. And the false prophet does all kind of miraculous things and wonders that cause people to be amazed and, 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 and they does uh, supernatural things like the Holy Spirit does. And so in the triune of evil in the last days, there will be the beast, the anti-God, the Antichrist, which you'll see operating on the earth, and then one who empowers the Antichrist is the same one that empowered Jesus, except God's divine spirit is called the Holy Spirit, and he's called the false prophet. And so this is the way you'll see. And so, you know, I know terms, and you haven't heard them before, and it might sound a little confusing, but you'll see all of these begin to act out. I'm just telling you that we need the Lord. We need the power of the Holy Spirit of God. God's going to speak to us by his word. And so these notes that you have are a reflection of trying to write down some of the things that you might need as you go back. Because I know all of you, when you leave, you know, like tomorrow, you'll be reading and going, what was that? And what was that? What was that? And I just encourage you to do that. Because remember, the book says, blessed is he who reads the words. Not who hears somebody else read the words. I'm reading the words to you. I'm, and, and I know this is a message, and I know this is a congregation of people, and it's a time of a little bit of instruction and teaching. But I'm being blessed. You know why? Because I'm reading these words. You're listening to the words. What I'm telling you is you need to read the words for yourself. You need to open up your Bible or your uh, whatever app or whatever it is you use to read it. I don't think the you know I don't think the mode is important. However you use it to read you, but but read these words for yourself, and then look at these little reminders that I've given you, and 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 hopefully it'll help lead you, and you won't be confused, and you'll have an idea of what it's talking about, because what even though those notes that you have, it's not an attempt to preach the sermon to you. It's just an attempt to say if I was if I was listening to this. These are some important things that I would want to write down for myself that I could help myself remember what's going on. Now, you obviously have enough room in those notes to write your own little thing if something else jumps up at you or if you want to clarify something or something like that. And so I just encourage you to do that. Remember, if you're watching online, you can contact us through Facebook and say, hey, I'd like to have those notes, and then we can send you a file with the notes and so forth, and we'll be glad to do that with no charge, obviously, attached to, to those things. But anyway, all right, so let's look. Let's look. Let's begin today because we enter a new section, and I'm going back to uh, chapter 1 and verse 19 because this is the natural outline of the whole book of Revelation. If you want to say, what is the book of Revelation really all about? Well, Jesus tells us in the 19th verse, when he's talking to John, he says, write the things which you have seen. The things which you have seen is all about the glory of Jesus Christ. What have you seen? You have seen Jesus Christ manifested on this earth. And so the first chapter of the book of Revelation is, is a vision of Jesus Christ and the fact that he lived on this earth and that he manifested himself and he was the love of God and the power of God and the strength of God, except this time when he comes back, he's altogether different. His nature's different. His purpose is different. 
the description of him is, you know, he has eyes that, are, have, that look like fire, meaning they pierce right through and they see the reality and the realness of you. And even though you may feel like you've hidden everything and nobody knows this kind of thing, when those eyes of fire pierce through us, they're very piercing, meaning, meaning like they look right through you and they see the real you and they see your real motives and they see the real person of you. And his feet are like finely burnished brass, which brass always represents judgment. So the fiery judgment, Jesus, the things you have seen, is the glory of God revealed in Jesus. Then the second thing he says, and the things which are. So John, uh, the, Jesus is saying, all right, John, tell them like it is. Tell them how things are. And so in order to tell us how things are, the Holy Spirit inspires John to use seven churches as representatives of how things are. And he's going to be for the next two chapters, in chapters 2 and 3, he's going to write a letter to seven churches. And these seven churches are seven real churches that actually existed in the days of John, which are around 96 AD, right around, right around the turn of the, of the first and second century there, right about 96 AD. These churches literally uh, I, wrote, I gave you a map uh, or showed you a map, and I just put it back up on the screen for you. And you may notice that uh, in a very loose way, okay, uh, the churches form somewhat of a circle. When you, when you talk about the first one, it's Ephesus, which is right down here. And then the next one is Smyrna. The next one is Pergamos. Next is Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And as you leave, they form somewhat loosely a circle. And, and so these are seven real churches that are mentioned so that God can tell us how things are. Now, when we look at these churches, you're going to be encouraged to become a church basher. All right, so, so look at your neighbor and say, we don't want to bash them. Okay, God did not reveal seven churches so that we could nitpick them. So that, we could, so that we could become negative about the church because I just remind you at the end of chapter 1, you remember from reading some pa the passages that, 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 one of, that what John saw, he saw Jesus standing in the midst of these seven candlesticks. That verse 20 says the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. So I'm encouraged that even though these churches are going to be described in some really tough ways, believe me, you know why? Because that's the way things are. That's how it is. And so even though these churches have lots of parts that are lacking and ways that they're disappointing and movements that, that are away from God and all of that, Jesus is still standing in the midst of them. And so I'm encouraged that Jesus is still with them, all right? So no matter how tough it seems and hard it seems, uh, the Spirit of God is saying, I'm still with you, even though you may disappoint me and you may not be everything you need to be. I'm standing in the midst of you. And verse 20 says that he's holding seven stars in his right hand. In his right hand, the right hand is the hand of authority, the hand of power, the hand of strength. So anytime you see the right hand, it, it, it's talking about authority or strength or power. And, and so he's standing in the midst of these seven lampstands that represent the seven churches, according to verse 20. And he, has, and he has the seven stars in his hand, which verse 20 says, and the seven stars are the seven angels of these seven churches. The word angel in the book of Revelation is talking about a messenger. So he would be talking about the messenger he has placed in each of these churches, and everybody say the pastors. Yeah, I've always wanted to be a star. You know, I, I know. <laughs> I know. Hey, look, we have lots of stars today. Athletes are stars. Musicians are stars. Uh, prosperous people are stars. Politicians are stars. But according to the Word of God, Jesus has some stars. And I would really rather be one of Jesus' stars than any of the rest of these stars. And so I'm encouraged. I'm just telling you that, that as we look for the next uh, six or seven weeks, because we're going to look at each one of these individually, because the Lord has a lot to say that I think will be helpful for us to see, see how it is, to see what's happening these days. This is the section in, these next, in, in chapters 2 and 3 where we get a glimpse at how it is. 
What's going on right now? How is it in the church? What is God doing? What is the church doing? Where is it going? Where is it moving to? And this is the area where we'll be able to look at it because we're current and we know and we live in it and we see it. And you'll be going, yeah, boy, I see that. Man, that's true right there. I don't know. I, and, you'll, and the Holy Spirit will begin to speak to you and prick you and challenge you. And, 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 and there will be things about your life that will be changed because you'll be able to see this. And you'll be going, oh, my goodness, that's me. And so as we look at the way things are, which is the second section, Seven churches are going to rise up, and there's going to be a letter to each of the seven churches, and the seven churches, uh, just to give you an idea, I know lots of people might think this way. If, you, if you're a spiritual person, which they're not a super amount of spiritual people, but if you are one of them, you might have thought in your life, you know, if we could just go back to the way it was, then things would be better. Things would be simpler. Things would be easier. In other words, we live in such a, a bad day. We live in such a, a, a demonic day. We live in such a desperate generation. Uh, life is so difficult. Living for Christ is so difficult now that if we could just go back to the way it was, then we would have an easier time obeying God and walking with Christ. And Man, I wish we could go back to those days. And the, and the seven churches are going to show you that it wouldn't, the first church, the churches that existed that were even led, some of them, by the apostles themselves, by, by the ones who walked with Christ, or at least by pastors who were trained by the ones that walked with Christ. We're talking about Jesus being gone for, one gener, for two generations. And a generation in the Bible, you might ask, how long is a generation well, a generation is usually considered, typically considered, about 40 years. That might give you an idea. Typically, it's about 40 years. In the Bible, in Job 42, 16, the Bible says, and Job lived 140 years and saw four generations. So if you want to know what the Bible considers to be a generation, Generally speaking now, don't hold this true because some other places in the Bible, it talks about David lived, blah, blah, 100 years and saw this. And some people said, well, a generation is 100 years. A generation is 70 years. A generation. But typically speaking, in the book of Job, gives us an example. Job lived 140 years and saw four generations. So you divide that out and what do you get? 35 years. So a generation, biblically speaking, is approximately 35 years. So two, two generations away from Jesus walking on the earth, we have some churches that exist that are the very first churches that existed after Jesus. And you, you can't really get closer to Jesus than that time. And yet here come seven letters to churches that existed just two generations after Jesus. And when you look at them and study them like we will, you'll find out that Jesus didn't really have good words to say to these churches. That there were lots of things going on in the churches that were deceitful and, and, and ungodly and, and wicked and, and anti-God and all of that kind of stuff. Even in these first seven churches, there are only two of them out of the seven, that God had nothing bad to say. Only two out of the seven. And, and, and there are only two that he speaks really only positive things. So that means five out of seven of these churches, God looks at them and says, hey, even though you exist, I have something against you. And I'm just saying to you that no matter, you can't run. Look at your neighbor and say, you can run, but you can't hide. All right, you can run, but you can't hide. In, in other words, it would uh, even if you go back to the first churches, the, the, uh, Christians still had problems. Christians still had uh, influences going on. It was not easier to live for Jesus in the days of the first church as it is now. They faced the same kind of issues, the same kind of problems. The only thing is they didn't have the internet and worldwide communication and all those things so that we can watch foolishness from all over the world. You know, We can be informed by evil and wickedness from all over the world. I mean, right now, you can pop out a little device and pull up something that can show you the foolishness and the evilness of man uh, all over the world at a moment's notice. And don't do it because I see some of you being tempted. Yeah, all right, all right. So I'm just telling you that God chooses seven churches to tell us how things are in the world. So these seven churches represent 
um, God's, God's voice to us about how, about how things are right now as we live. What is the church like? What is your life like? What, is, what, are, the, what are the pitfalls of your life? What are the failures of your life? What are the successes of your life? What does God want from you? What does he expect from you? So the natural outline is how, tell them the things you have seen, which is the glory of God, Jesus Christ revealed. Now tell them the things that are, how things are. And then he says, all right, now tell them what's going to be hereafter. And the bulk of the book of Revelation from chapter 4 all the way through 22 is prophecy. You know what prophecy is? Prophecy is writing history before it happens. Uh, prophecy is telling us what kind of things are going to be that we don't know anything about, how things are going to be into the future. And out of all the writings in the world, the Bible is the only book that contains prophecy. All the writings, I mean, every religion has its own religious book. Every, every religious leader and every religious movement that's ever existed has its own quote, Bible for, for itself, but none of those books by human authors contain prophecy. And the reason why is because all the writers of these human books understood that the moment they put a word of prophecy in their writings and that prophecy did not come true, then their books would be burned and their books would be discarded as being false because the prophecy was not fulfilled. But God, with daring and boldness, wrote us words of prophecy that were 100, 200, 500, 2,000, 3,000, 6,000 years ahead of its time to tell us what was going on because God was not intimidated to tell us how things were going to be because God knows how things are going to be because he's the author of creation and he is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And so most of the book, starting with chapter 4 through 22, will tell us how things are. So there are four um, applications I want you to see. And you might want to write these four down in your margin, and you can start up there. I described three of them under that Jesus chose seven representatives. Those first three little points are three of them. Let me give you one more that's not written in there about how we look at what happens with the way things are. Here's how we can look at it. There are four ways to look at these messages to seven churches. Number one, this is the not one that's not written in any of that, is personally. In other words, when I, when I read the passages to the church at Ephesus, and you see those seven verses, and those seven verses say things to the church at Ephesus, even though it's talking to a church that really did exist on the earth, it's also talking to me personally. Because even though I was not a part of that church, the spirit and the nature of what is being said might reflect something personally about myself. And the reason I know that God is using this letter to talk personally to us is he uses phrases like this, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the spirit says. In other words, are you listening to the Holy Spirit yourself? Are you, do you personally have your ears on? You know, we had a craze back, what, uh, I'm so old now, uh, 30 years ago. <laughs> Somebody help me. Uh, where we had the CB radio craze, you know, and everybody was, hey, good buddy, got your ears on? You know, got your ears on? What was that? That was a question like, are you listening? Do I have you? Are you, are you on the right channel? Do you, are you tuning in? Well, let him who has ears to hear is Jesus' way of asking, you got your ears on, good buddy? Are you hearing what I'm saying? So in the, in the seven churches, there is a personal, there's an opportunity for you personally to hear something from the Holy Spirit that will challenge your life personally. And the second phrase that says something's happening personally is, and to him who overcomes, I will give the kingdom. In other words, you have an opportunity to make a choice. Even though right now you may not be with Christ, right now you may be sitting in a church somewhere and, and, and you're interested in the things of God, but you've never yielded your heart to God. You've never asked him to save your soul, change your life, or make any difference in you, that you still have a chance for this. 
God's writing a letter to a church. A church is a group of called out ones. The word is ecclesia. It means those called out of. And that's what the church, that's what the name church means. So you may be sitting in a group of called out ones, but you are not surrendered to the one that called them out. And even though you're in a church and you look good and you smell good and you smile good and you act good and you, you know, all of that, the word is Jesus is challenging you personally and saying, are you listening to what I'm saying? Because you still have a chance to become an overcomer so that you can receive the promises rather than the curses that follow in this book. So the first application of looking at these seven letters is personal. Man, this may say something to me personally, and I believe it will. Then the second way to look at the letters, and, and, and here comes number one that's written in there for you, just write out beside it, literal, L-I-T-E-R-A-L, literal. In other words, the word that's written is literally to a church that does exist, that does, is just like Jesus describes it. And so whenever I look at this, I can look and say, okay, this is how this church was. Literally, it's a real church, real people. It's not something made up. It's not an analogy to represent anything. It's a real church with real people. And this is what Jesus is saying to that church. And then secondly, the second number, write out the word practical practical. So I can look at it personally, I can look at it literally, and practically just simply means that as I read about these seven churches, this is information, this is, uh, these are things that could happen in any church, anywhere, at any time. So the way the church of Ephesus is described could describe really almost any church in any age at any time. It could be describing Freedom River Church. Because the characteristics of the church at Ephesus are like the characteristics here. It could reflect people in the church, people you know. It could reflect churches that you've been to, maybe used to be a part of your life. In, in, in other words, any church, anywhere, at any time could have some of the characteristics of all of these churches. And so there is a, a practical way to look at it. And then, of course, the fourth way is prophetically. Right out that besides that three, uh, prophetically. And by prophetically, I mean that God is giving us a picture of how the church, is, the church is going to be through the ages of church life. You guys do know that the church has moved through uh, 2,000, a little over 2,000 years of church life, right? That uh, Christ came, gave himself for the church. When he left, the Holy Spirit established the church used the apostles, used, used those that were trained by the apostles. A lot of people read, we read about in the Bible, the book of Acts, started churches, and the Christians were called, uh, and, the, and, and, the, and, the, and the church or the apostle were called Christians first at Antioch, you know, so churches began to be established because people looked at these called out ones and began to describe them as Christians which means little Christ, by the way. And the Christian and the believers, the disciples, were called Christians first at Antioch. In other words, it was the lost world that looked at these believers and began to describe them as little Christ. It wasn't the believers that said, you know what they need to call us? They need to call us little Christ. It was an unbelieving world that looked at them and said, how can we describe them? Well, the only way we can describe them is their little Christ, which says to me, you know, if you say, what would that be saying? Well, you got, you got your ears on? <laughs> what would that be saying to me? That would be saying, has anybody ever called me a little Christ? I'm kind of the persuasion that uh, you have no right to call yourself a little Christ until somebody outside the church calls you one, you know? We're so adept at calling ourselves Christians, and we describe ourselves as Christians. But what I would ask is, has anybody else ever described you as a Christian? Has anyone else said to you, man, you so obviously represent God that you are a Christian? That person is a Christian. And when they, when they say we're a Christian, then I can say, okay, I'm a Christian. Until then, I'm a believer. I'm a disciple. I'm trying to go to the Lord. But, uh, but anyway, that's a hot point. It, 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 ears, I pray, there, there's a personal thing. Uh, so these represent the ages of the church. Now, as you look at them in church ages, 
what you're looking at is you're looking at the way the church moves through these 2,000 years of life. And, and, and the point of this, I think, is to help us to see the fact that the church has changed and that the church is moving in a direction. And we need to know this because we are in one of these ages. And what I'm purporting to you is that we are in the last one. We are in the seventh church. We, we, we are there. We are in this last generation of where the church is described by certain characteristics and certain qualities, and we need to know this. Why would we need to know this? Well, we know that if we're in the seventh, there's no more, right? If we're in the seventh, it means, uh-oh, we're coming to the end of this thing. He didn't say there's one more, by the way. He said these are the seven ages. And let me just, I wrote them in your, in your outline, and I'm just going to kind of just graze through them just a second. I'm pro, I, I hope I don't get bogged down here, but let me, just, let me just mention them as we go through. The first one, the first church, the first letter, uh, we'll start it next week. Personally, we'll look at the church at Ephesus. We'll look at all seven verses, what it says, how it describes, and so forth, and see what God will say to us personally through the church at Ephesus. But the church at Ephesus is the, uh, it, it is the beginning church. It's, it, 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 it's the church, the first church that existed on this earth. It was the church that was birthed out of the end of the book of Acts. It was that church that, uh, according to the note, and I just wrote it for you, just two short generations from, uh, removed from Jesus, and, and they had already lost their fire and their zeal and their passion for the Lord. One of the chief things Jesus says to them is, you're doing this good, 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 boom, but I have somewhat against you. You have, you, you, you have left your first love. And he doesn't say you lost it. He said you left it. You've made a choice to walk away. And it doesn't mean that they're pagans and, 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 and heretics and they've turned their back on Christ and they've become agnostics and they don't believe in Jesus anymore. He just says you've simply walked away from that first zeal, that first passion, that hot heart for Jesus. And so, you know, you are already in the first generation since Jesus. They're already beginning to lose their heart, to lose their passion, to lose their drive, which leads to the second generation, which is uh, beginning in about 160, the church at Smyrna. The church at Smyrna is the second one that is written to. The church at Smyrna is one of those where the Lord had nothing bad to say about it. You know why? Because the church at Smyrna is the, is the church that is persecuted, the church that is filled with martyrs. Not to get bogged down in too much history, but just, you know, I know some of you like to hear a little bit of what was going on there. Uh, long about the, a little bit before, about 50 years before the birth of Christ or the change of time that reflects the birth of Christ, uh, the Roman Empire began to have uh, uh, kings, so to speak, really kings, leaders that were uh, named Caesars. They were not of the same family, but, they, but the, the king name was Caesar. The first one was Julius, and Julius passed away, and when Julius passed away, there was some kind of a, um, some kind of a, a sign or something uh, miraculous or supernatural happened, and the people said, he's a god! And so the Roman people began to worship all the Caesars as god, and of course, the next one you'll know because you've heard his name a lot, especially in the book of Luke, and in the days of Caesar... Augustus, yeah, all the world, he sent out a decree that all the world should be taxed. And that's what brought Mary and Joseph, you know, to Bethlehem because they were the house and lineage of Jesus. So uh, the Caesars began to live and die. Well, by the time you get to a Caesar, and I know you've heard his name before, Caesar Nero, Nero fiddled while Rome burned. You know, he was wacko. Most of these Caesars were uh, really mentally ill people. And and not only mentally, but demonically and everything else. It was, if you read anything about them, they're just wild and crazy. But Caesar Nero well, began to persecute Christians pretty bad. I mean, he began to call them because they wouldn't say Caesar's Lord and they wouldn't burn incense to Caesar, which meant he was a god. They believed if you burned incense that as you breathe that incense in, the incense, you know, was like smoke. And when you breathe it in you were breathing a little bit of Caesar inside of you and you became like Caesar. I'm, I'm telling you, that's what they, they believed. And, and, and because the Christians wouldn't do that, then Nero began to persecute them and punish them and feed them to the lions and put them in prison and boil them in oil and, and all of these negative things. And from Caesar to a real wacko by the name of Diocletian, which he was not only mentally ill, he was demonically ill, and he was the one who had John thrown on the Isle of Patmos, 86-year-old man, 
I mean, how much damage could an 86-year-old man do to you? But John, right, John was so, so feared by Domitian that, that he cast an 86-year-old man on the Isle of Patmos. You know what he didn't know? He didn't know it wasn't the man that had the power. It was the message. That's what it was really all about. See, that's, why I didn't, that's what encourages me so much. It's not me. I mean, man, I'm look, I'm a 62 year old man in some little tiny place in some little tiny off, you know, place outside of Gulfport, Mississippi, um, who speaks to four, five, you know, six, eight, ten people online or whatever it might be. And uh, I mean, who am I? I am nobody, but I'm encouraged to know that even though it's not, you know, the messenger, it's the message that has power. It's the message that is the strength giver. And the challenger is not me. It's what God inspires and what God says. The same way with the, with the Apostle John on the, Isle of, uh, on the Isle of Patmos. But Smyrna becomes the persecuted church. And that lasts uh, through the ages until about 325. Well, in 325, what happens? Well, Constantine, the Roman general, uh, comes to the Lord. Or, or that's what, you know, for him, that's what happens. He sees this vision in the sky and... This vision looks like a cross, and Constantine, who is conquering all of the pagan worlds uh, at that day as a general, says, oh, that's a sign that God's with me. And so he says, if God's with me, then God's going to bless me, and we're going to conquer the world. And he began to do it in the name of the Lord because he believes that that was a sign in the sky that said God was with him. And so Constantine becomes a champion, so to speak, for Christianity. It's, it's bogus. It's, it's out of whack. It's crazy. But that's what he thinks. And so every time he goes in and conquers a, a pagan land, he declares that that land is Christian. And then he takes water, and he gets the whole little town, and or a group of people, and there's multiple like 55 gallon drums or so of water, and he just takes his hand and he begins to just throw the water all over people, and he gets sprinkled a little bit, and he says, "I baptize you in the name of the Lord." Blah 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 blah. In other words, he declares that everybody in the town is a Christian because they were conquered by somebody who he believes was being led by Christ, and so basically all of the Roman world become pro Christians. Now, this doesn't mean they have any heart for God. It doesn't mean they've become real. It just means they've been declared Christians. So what happens in the Pergamos age? The, the, the church marries the world. In other words, the, 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 the church, the world doesn't become more Christian. The church becomes more worldly because the people that are coming into the church by decree and by order are not filled with the Spirit of Christ. They are not led by the Spirit of God. They are not surrendered to the will of God. They are declared Christian by a Roman government official that says the official religion of the Roman Empire is now Christianity, and everybody who's part of the Roman Empire is now a Christian. Well, of course, that began to take the persecution away from Christians in, in the Smyrna church age who were suffering and being fed to the lions and boiled in oil and, and banished to islands and, and so forth. And now, uh, instead of fighting the church, the devil joins the church. Now, you might find this hard to believe, but the church always flourishes under persecution. If you want to say, man, what, when is the church strongest? The church is strongest when we're being persecuted. The church is strongest when we're being abused and misused. When the church has to go underground and the church has to live out what it says it believes, when the church is being chased down and hunted down and our lives are on the line, that's when the church is the strongest. Everybody say, the hypocrites run away. Yeah, under persecution, the hypocrites say, whoa, I don't want any of that, man. You know, I, no. And so the church is purged and clean. So here's what the devil does. The devil, in, it, as it moves through, you know, he begins to move against the church, and, and, and he begins to get them complacent, and he begins to get them sidetracked, and he begins to get them to look in other ways. And so their zeal and their passion and their hot heart for God begins to get weaker and weaker and weaker. And then the devil says, all right, I got them where I want them now. And so he begins to punish them and persecute them. He tries to scare them. He puts them in boiling oil. He feeds them the lions, blah, blah, blah. 
But then all of a sudden, the church says, man, we've got to be real. And they begin to meet underground and they begin to have prayer meetings and they begin to uh, watch out for each other and they begin to commit themselves to the Lord. And they begin to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to protect them and God. So in other words, they become stronger when they're being persecuted. The devil says, uh-oh, I made a mistake. Uh, what can I do to do that? He said, oh, okay, well, what we'll do now is we won't fight them. We'll join them. And so in the Pergamos error, what happens is the church and the world get married. And Christianity becomes a popular national religion that is led by the state. And what happens then is people who are not true, people who don't know the Lord, begin to get positions of leadership like you have a town, and in this town, there may not be one person who personally knows the Lord. But now somebody has to lead the spiritual congregation of that town. Who's it going to be? Well, can anybody read? You know, that would be the first question. And remember, they're going to have to read Latin, which is, you know, what the Bible's in at that point. And by the way, they didn't have little Bibles, personal Bibles like you guys had, so no individual person could read the Bible. They had the Bibles chained to the pulpits in the churches so nobody would steal it. So the only Bible that might be in a whole community of people is chained to a pulpit at the church, which even if they could get it, they couldn't read it because they weren't educated and they were poor. And so they had to depend on what this person who stood up behind this pulpit read out of that Bible that that person who's reading it was probably the butcher last week. So he, you know... I mean, he's just been declared the, the preacher because he can read. I mean, come on. Not that he knows God, not that he has a call of God, or he might have been the banker, or he might have been the mayor, or whoever he might have been. So he just stands up and begins to read. He, he reads stuff he doesn't understand, stuff he doesn't know. And so there are all kind of perversions of what the Bible is, what it's about, what it says, what it contains. They, they know nothing about the synthesis of the Bible. They know nothing about how the, 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 the prophecies and the words go together and flow together and fit together. They, they, they know nothing. And so all of a sudden, the church begins to hear things that are contrary to the things of God, but they're taught, this is God. And so the church becomes more and more worldly all along, and it's poisoned. And of course, what that leads to is that leads to the church age at Thyatira, where false doctrine leads to great sin. If I don't believe certain things are sinful, then I do them and I practice them because I haven't been taught that those things are wrong. And so now the church begins to really fall away because now the church not only is not doing the right thing, they don't even know to do the right thing. So Thyatira is the church of great sin. And of course, this just takes the church deeper and deeper and deeper. And then that leads to the, the church age of Sardis. And at Sardis, um, these, this false doctrine uh, that opened the door to great sin uh, led to uh, a church age and a period of history known as the Dark Ages. You guys are, know that, right? Yeah, the Dark Ages, they were dark. How dark were they? <laughs> well, they were really dark because the people, you know, for, for hundreds of years, the people had no idea of what was going on. The churches were dark. The churches were dim. And then, of course, people began to be inspired toward the end of the Dark Ages. People like John Calvin, people like Martin Luther, the, the Reformers came out. You know what they began to say? They began to look at their own church life, and they began to say, you know, this isn't right. And the Spirit of God began to boil around in some of these people and began to say, this is not right. This is not what God said. You guys, point of interest, I'm fixing to quit. I know it's time. Uh, just point of interest. You know, you guys, have you ever heard of Martin Luther? Any of you ever heard of Martin Luther? Yeah, so Martin Luther was the Catholic priest that got converted and reformed out of the Catholic Church and started the, the Protestant Reformation. He was the priest. You know, how, you know what happened to him? You know how this happened? You interested in it? Okay, let me just show you how the Holy Spirit works is all I'm saying to you. Now, remember, he's in the church age of where it's total darkness, Sardis. I mean, the church has gone away from God. The world has gone dark because without the truth and without the disciplines of God, there's no forward movement and there's no spirit. So here's Martin Luther, and Martin Luther's training to be a priest. And in order to be a priest, you had to go to a, to a monastery. And at this monastery, all these men that were training to be priests had to do what they call penance. Now, if you've ever been a Catholic, you understand penance, right? When you go to the priest and you say, 
bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And he said, what is your sin? And he'll say, I told a lie last week. And he said, all right, here's what you're going to have to do to pay for that lie. You have to do so many Hail Marys, and then you're going to have to do this. And then he might name something that you might have to do. Well, all the little trainee priests, uh, you know, they obviously had sin in their life, uh, uh, evidently. And a lot of times their penance would be to clean the steps of, of St. Peter's in Rome. Big old granite, nice, beautiful. Each step of St. Peter's had a passage of Scripture written on the face of the step. And so as these little priests were scrubbing, like almost with a little tiny brush, like a toothbrush, they were scrubbing that step every day in order to pay for their sins. They would scrub a step, and on that step they were scrubbing, there would be a verse of Scripture. Well, Martin Luther kept getting the same steps. <laughs> And the steps were a quote out of the book of Romans. And the, and, the, and the quote was, and the just shall live by faith. And every day as Martin Luther read the, the, the passage from Romans that said, and the just shall live by faith, the Holy Spirit began to speak to him and say, you're living by anything but faith. You're down here scrubbing a step so you can make it to heaven one day. That's not faith. That's works. You're trying to do something to earn your way in and gain your way in, and everybody else here is doing the same things. That's not right, and the Holy Spirit began to challenge his heart, and when the Holy Spirit converted the heart of a priest wannabe, he began to write down theses, sentences of what was wrong with the church he was in, the Catholic church, and he then took those writings and he took it he went over to to the to the to the temple and he nailed those those theses those sentences about what was wrong with the church onto the church door and declared that he was no longer a part of this and he protested out of the catholic church therefore starting the Protestant Reformation. So in other words, this complete period of darkness, the Holy Spirit used that to move into the hearts of individuals like John Calvin, as an example, who started Sunday school classes trying to teach people the Bible because the Holy Spirit said, these people aren't studying the Word of God. So in other words, the Spirit of God used the darkness of those days to change the direction of the church, which led it in an ultimate greater direction, which led to the church at Philadelphia, which is the church of brotherly love. Philadelphia, uh, phileo means brotherly love. Five words in the, in the, in the Greek language, uh, eros, agape, uh, phileo, um, let's see, what other, um, uh, anyway, I wasn't prepared to mention that, but there are five <laughs> words, there are five words in the Greek language, eros is one of them, it means erotic love, it's not mentioned in the Bible, but you have, you have phileo, which phileo means I love you like a brother, which means, that's why we get the word Philadelphia, Philadelphia, the city of loving you like a brother, brotherly love. And, and the, so the church at Philadelphia becomes a, the Reformation church, the church of revival and so forth. And then sadly, the last church age is the church at Laodicea, which is the church that's lukewarm, the church that is passionless, spiritless. And, and uh, God says, that I wish you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Anyway, we'll look at all of these and these are the seven church ages. The thing that's important to know, I believe, is that we are in these last days. We are in Laodicea and church age. I'll talk to you more about it. Boy, time just goes way too fast when we're on this stuff. I didn't even get to the reason why things are this bad, really. So maybe, I'll, maybe we'll just pick up. Um, are you guys in a hurry? I mean, to get through? I know it's time to go because you can't hardly sit anymore. 
But, uh, but, but anyway, the Spirit of God, I believe God's going to speak to you, guide your heart, open up revelation to you. You say, man, I, you know, I don't like too much history. Well, I don't think there'll be too much. I think you'll, you'll come on out of this. You'll get going because it really is important to see how God works. And the important thing is to remember and the thing to be encouraged by is even though God says these things to these seven churches and said this is how things are, he's still standing in the midst of them. In other words, he hasn't left these churches. He's standing there in the midst. He's still with them, and he has the, the seven pastors in his hands, the stars in his hands, and so he still has us. He hasn't deserted us, and he hasn't left us, and he's saying to us, listen, look at the way things are. Be challenged by the way things are because it's not going to be like this much longer, and your opportunity is now, and so if you have ears to hear uh, Receive Christ, become an overcomer, and great things can happen in your life. So it's a personal word of challenge, and it's like, before it's too late, come on, get right, before it's too late. That's why the book reveals and opens. You say, what is the, what's the goodness? What is the purpose of this book? This book is to challenge us so that we won't be caught by surprise, so that we won't be left behind, so that we'll know what's going on, that we can become everything Christ wants us to be in this old crazy, dark world we live in. How many of you are aware every day that everything in society now is being led by one spirit, and the spirit is the spirit of unity? I don't know if you've noticed this or not. If you read it in your notes, you'll see what I'm talking about. In other words, we are encouraged by, just think of anything in your life. Think of anything that you hear about every day that is not challenging you to become unified with the rest of the world in everything. Money, uh, language, uh, measurement, communication. Do you know what I just heard a couple of days ago? I mean, yeah, it was a couple of days ago. There was a satellite launched by a company called SpaceX. We used, we used to have a company that launched things and did things for America. It was called NASA. Now, SpaceX, worldwide, everybody say, worldwide. worldwide. Everybody, everybody, yeah, pay the money, join the ride, baby. So we don't have an independent uh, American uh, conglomerate saying we're working for America to make America the leader in space travel. We have now have a company called SpaceX that anybody who has the money can say, send something up for us, and, and there you go. And I'm just using that as an example. I'm just saying, there you go. There's a perfect example. You know what they, I heard a couple of days ago? They launched a satellite for a communication satellite for Bangladesh. I'm thinking, what in the world would Bangladesh want to communicate? I mean, come on, man. I mean, you guys, you guys remember Bangladesh? I mean, back in my hippie generation, man, Bangladesh was like the heathen outback uh, uh, third world junk pile. I mean, come on, man. And now Bangladesh is launching satellites for communication around the world. It's just an example of what's happening. I mean, have you, ever, have you guys heard of cryptocurrency? I know when I say that, you go, what? Crypto? Have you ever heard of Bitcoin? Do you want, I don't understand Bitcoins, but I'm just mentioning them as an example. Bitcoins are a worldwide currency now. It's called cryptocurrency, and Bitcoins are just one brand of cryptocurrency. Internet currency. Everybody has it. Not, not, not in God we trust, God bless the USA, dollar bill, but a currency that is used all over the world. I, I, I got to quit because I know you guys are... All right, let's stand our feet, stand our feet. We got lots to see, lots to say, lots to do. I'm just tra saying this week, let me give you one little challenge. Just look at everything in your life. Look at everything. Look at, look at communication. Look at economics. Look at, um, uh, you know, look at uh, uh, measurement. Uh, look at language. Uh, look at everything and see how much of everything in your life is leading you to be a worldwide issue, not USA or whatever country you're from, independent. It's an attempt to push us all into one unified group of people. You know why? Because if one world leader is going to come and lead all of us, one thing that has to be true about the world, it has to be unified. In order for one person to lead everybody, everybody has to be together. 
And so in order for everybody to be together, all of our lives have to be led toward being unified. One world something, one world police force, one world council, one world church, one world everything. And just look at your life and see how you're moving toward that right now. I'm not condemning you. I'm just saying look at it and pay attention and try to find anything in your life that's happening that's not encouraging you to become part of a unified world. All right. All right.